Welcome to GTS Car Life, I'm Thomas. Today, we take a look at not only one of the best values in a Porsche 911, but also one of the most fun to drive. The 2003 Porsche 911 Type 996. The Porsche 996 is the perfect 911. If you're a fan of Porsche's 911 model, you've probably participated in many conversations debating which 911 is the best. Of course, there are as many different variables and qualifying factors as there are 911 models. Today, we take a look at the Porsche 996, a revolutionary car in its time. On its introduction in 1998, this was the first all-new 911 in 34 years, and one which remains unique all these years later. To fully understand the Type 996, you need to understand what was happening in the world at the time, and specifically, what was happening to Porsche. The Type 996 was developed and built at a unique time in Porsche's history, and addressed some very specific and critical needs for the German sports car manufacturer. This was the 911 that, quite literally, needed to bridge the gap between the company's storied, air-cooled past and its hopeful but questionable future. In the 1990s, Porsche was a company that had built an enviable, highly respected reputation based largely on one model. That model, the 911, was originally introduced in 1963 as the Type 901, and although Porsche, as it is known to do, made significant and substantial improvements over the years, the car remained essentially the same for 35 years. Think about that. Porsche successfully sold an air-cooled rear-engine coupe designed in the 60s with technology used in the 50s for 35 years. And due to circumstances like Porsche's low volume, highly unorganized and rather crude and largely hand-built manufacturing process, these cars were very expensive to produce. Add in market fluctuations and extreme currency changes affecting the US dollar versus the Deutsche Mark, and Porsche was left with a seriously outdated, overpriced sports car sold mainly on nostalgia and unable to meet upcoming standards for crash safety, emissions, power, and even daily livability. Porsche needed an all-new design, the first ever clean sheet redesign, and the only all-new platform since 1963. This new 911, which was designed by Pinky Lai under the supervision of Porsche design chief Harm Guy, had not only huge shoes to fill, but also a very long and serious list of newly conceived mandates. I've included a link below to a really great interview that one of my favorite YouTubers and magazine publishers, Lee Sibley, did with Pinky Lai, and I think you'll find it as interesting as I did. Porsche needed an all-new platform, a design slightly larger and capable of meeting next-generation crash safety standards. Increasing the wheelbase and track would also improve high-speed stability and reduce the negative effects of the 911's rear engine placement. The 911's infamous Widowmaker reputation would be banished to the past. The design would have to be much easier and more efficient to build, thereby dramatically lowering Porsche's manufacturing costs. This new 911 would require an all-new powertrain with an all-new water-cooled flat-six engine able to deliver the horsepower, drivability, and emission standards demanded by customers as well as government agencies. And the car had to be profitable. Porsche was hemorrhaging money, and this new 911 was literally a do-or-die product. There were other significant models the mid-engine Boxster, which was designed alongside the 996, but preceded it to market, and the Volkswagen-based first-generation Cayenne SUV among them. But nobody can dispute that the Porsche brand is more closely linked to its halo car, the 911, than any other model. Everyone recognizes the 911 as a Porsche, even those who do not consider themselves a car person. In fact, still today, there is a sizable contingent who do not consider any model besides the 911 to be a true Porsche. In the mid-70s, the company tried, and failed, to replace the 911 with a modern, clean-sheet design in the V8-powered, front-engine, rear-transaxle 928. Porsche diehards could not have been less interested, and the 928 was eventually left to die, while the car it was created to replace is now approaching 60 years in production. So, how did Porsche and its design team do? This is a 2003 Porsche 911 Carrera Type 996. I happen to know quite a bit about this particular 911 because it used to be mine. I purchased this car from its original owner back in 2008, 
Today, it enjoys a life of luxury with its third owner and has traveled over 105,000 miles. The 996 offers a genuine Porsche experience. It is beautiful, especially in this deep, luster seal gray paint with a classic 911 shape. It is simple, free of any electronic nannies aside from anti-lock brakes, and it is an absolute pleasure to drive. In fact, with electric steering, throttle by wire, large distracting touch screens replacing switches and buttons, and a myriad of driver assistance software, a strong argument can be made that with only a few exceptions, today's sports cars have become GT cruisers instead. Very capable, yes, but devoid of that exhilarating, engaging, even raw driving experience that made sports cars and the 911 so irresistible in the first place. This is one of my all-time favorite Porsche 911s. I know the 996 was controversial for many years. It seems to have really started to get a following now. It's a tremendous car. It's beautiful. It sounds great. It's one of the most fun Porsche 911s there are to drive. The newer ones, yeah, they're more capable. On track, no comparison. But for everyday driving, you can't beat this car. This car, the Porsche 911 Type 996, is unique. It still delivers that special, more simple sports car experience and offers just enough extra to make it thoroughly practical, enjoyable, and reliable as an only car and a daily driver. Unlike today's newer 911s, you can see and access the boxer engine through the rear engine cover. There is something very reassuring and enjoyable about that. With high-end performance cars like the 911, most manufacturers dress up their engines and engine bay, going so far as using glass covers, stylized componentry and cover-ups, even an engine area lighting. I find it very disappointing that Porsche has chosen to completely hide the engine on its new sports cars. Well, that is certainly not a problem here. Likewise, the unique back seats make this a car you can actually own and use with a family or pets. Try that with any two-seat competitor. This is one truly beautiful 911. The finish is seal gray metallic, one of my all-time favorites. I love the Carrera style wheels. They really fit the car. The designer of, the, of this car, Pinky Lay, really incorporated a lot of 993 styling into the car. The front bucket seats are among the best in their class and utilize the well-established high back bucket design of previous 911s. This particular 911 has the rare and desirable sports seats with painted hard seat backs. I really love this touch and I wish I had it on my current 911. This car also has the optional factory sport exhaust system with a dash mounted switch to decrease the exhaust volume for those rare times when a more quiet 911 is desirable. Overall, the 996 provides more true 911 driving experience than today's newer, larger, more capable and refined 911s do. On the road, this Carrera sounds wonderful with a unique sound full of bass I can't imagine anyone wanting to replace this factory system with anything aftermarket. The naturally aspirated engine on this 2003 model was rated at 320 horsepower, and because of the car's low weight and sturdy construction, 0 to 60 times come up in a very quick 4.8 seconds. The rush feels even more exciting than that, and for those brave enough, top speed comes up at 177 miles per hour. I can tell you this car is very stable with two occupants at 120 miles per hour even in strong crosswinds. You can feel the car hunker down where the automatic rear spoiler deploys. This car instills confidence in the way it holds the road and provides outstanding and instantaneous feedback through its lightly loaded hydraulic steering system. It's a thrill ride of a type you just can't find today. The 996 has enough power to be thrilling, but not so much that it can't be enjoyed on the street. Newer 911s have so much power and the traction limits are so high that outside of a racetrack, they are really impossible to ring out. Even on track, most people aren't skilled enough to really enjoy today's versions. This has become a widespread problem with manufacturers seemingly more concerned with Nürburgring lap times than actual smiles generated. And for the moment at least, this phenomenon is only getting worse with the introduction of increasingly more high torque electric vehicles. The 996 may truly be one of the last great driving experiences. While the 996 delivers a true Porsche driving experience, it, like every car ever made, does have some shortcomings. Perhaps the weakest aspect of any 996 is the interior. The design dates all the way back to the Porsche's Boxster concept vehicle, which made its debut in the mid-90s and incorporated ovals and bubble styling, something which was popular at the time. 
The look was appropriate on the original production Boxster, but 911 buyers never warmed to it, and the idea of sharing an interior with a lowly entry-level model only added to the dislike. The main difference between the 996 interior and that of the Boxster was the instrument binnacle, which featured a different hood on the two models, and which contained the traditional five dials on the 911 model, but only three on the lesser Boxster. Interior materials, too, were let down when compared to the previous hand-built 911s. Hard plastics, cheap to produce switches and components obviously sourced from the Boxster, all lent a decidedly low rent feel to Porsche's flagship model. Components like the digital climate control and radio are known to fail. Another common weak point is the ignition switch, which tends to break often. At least it's inexpensive and easy to replace. Other cost-cutting measures adopted from paid consultants and former Toyota executives included replacing individual door-mounted window switches with one centrally located shared set. In spite of the obvious flaws, the interior incorporates vastly superior ergonomics over its air-cooled predecessors. Like all 911s, these cars are surprisingly spacious inside and can accommodate taller people with ease. The child-intended rear seats are more accommodating than the ones found in the previous air-cooled models and can actually accommodate adults for short trips, something most other sports cars can only dream about. In fact, the interior of any 911 really makes these cars very useful as daily drivers and separates them from the many competitors that have come and gone over what will soon be 60 years. Early 996s also shared the Boxster's entire front clip, including the universally derided fried egg headlamp units, which were much easier and cheaper to produce and assemble than previous models. The headlamp design was improved greatly with the 2002 mid-cycle refresh known as the 996.2, and the sharper style units now came from the company's Halo Turbo model. I've always enjoyed the front headlamps. To me, I know that the early ones had that fried egg look that everybody talks about. I really think the main problem with that was just the fact that the Boxster had it first and it really was uh, difficult to distinguish the front of a Boxster from a 911. I understand that. Nobody wants to have their 911 compared to a much less expensive car. But when, especially when Porsche added the turbo look headlamps, it looks great. The side profile still looks like a Porsche 911. It's the same as a 993 or even today's 911s, but just with the fog lamps incorporated. And they did a really nice job. It really reminds me of a Le Mans racer. It looks very purposeful, muscular, but clean, not overstated. This car is almost 20 years old, but it doesn't look it. It feels current, fresh. It's what a 911 is supposed to be. Frankly, to most eyes, the 996 looks no better and no worse today than it did when it was introduced. The interior and front end styling was a significant break from the past, and many never fully accepted it. Porsche didn't help matters when it returned to a more traditional front end look, leaving this design behind with the launch of the successor Type 997 in 2004. Other features I really appreciate about the 996 are the large, usable front trunk, the fact you get an actual space saver spare tire, the built-in attachment points for a roof carrier, the functional and neat pop-up rear spoiler, first offered on the Type 964, the window frame mounted rear view mirrors, which greatly reduced the possibility of expensive body damage as compared to the previous and current 911's door mounted mirrors, and these cool multi-directional side marker lights, first introduced with the Type 996 and still used on Porsche models today. This 911 also has the factory optional aero side skirts, a really expensive but great looking add-on. To my view, these Carrera wheels were the best style available on the 996 and rank among the nicest designs in Porsche's 74 year history. So if the prospect of a terrific driving experience, a purity of design long since lost with today's new cars, and the shockingly low market value of the Porsche 911 Type 996 has you in the market for your next sports car, you're not alone. Here are some things to consider. Don't be afraid of mileage on a 996. In fact, most experts agree a higher mileage 996 will generally be more reliable than an ultra low mileage garage queen. These cars, in fact all cars, need to be driven. Age is much more of a factor than mileage. The key is to find a well-maintained 996 with reasonable mileage and an extensive and expensive documented service history, preferably from a franchise Porsche dealer or reputable Porsche specialist shop. If the previous owner's idea of maintenance includes Jiffy Lube, it's probably not the 911 for you. The most likely item is to need repair or replacement, 
will be those made from plastic or rubber, like wiring harness connectors, trim pieces, rubber bushings, and other mechanical pieces that will age poorly, dry out, and become brittle from extreme heat, cold, and other weather conditions. Engine compartment coolant bottles are plastic, and the heat of the rear-mounted engine means you can expect the bottles to become brittle and crack on a regular basis. As I said earlier, the dashboard-mounted ignition switches also tend to be a weak spot. And be careful using items like the clever dash-mounted cup holders and the vanity mirrors. Again, age and temperature serve to make these items prone to breaking. In fact, both have been replaced on this car. Of course, any discussion of Porsche's 996 or early 997 would not be complete without mention of the possibility of leaking rear main seals or failure-prone IMS bearings. In truth, there's not a car made which doesn't suffer from some kind of problem. At least with the 996, we know what to look for. Any purchase of a used vehicle should include a proper pre-purchase inspection by a qualified specialist. If the rear main seal shows signs of an active leak, be sure to factor in the rather high replacement cost into your purchase price. Also, if the 996 you're interested in has not had its IMS bearing replaced with a stronger aftermarket version, you may want to consider factoring that in as well. The upgraded bearing is best replaced when the car is in for a new clutch. Odds are, if the car you're looking at hasn't had a failure by now and is still on the original bearing, your car will likely not suffer from the problem. But there is something to be said for peace of mind. A quick Google search or an hour spent on a forum like Renlist will provide you with much more detailed information and options. Just remember to filter out the online hysteria you're going to find. Some people have nothing better to do or something to gain by overstating the reality. As for normal maintenance, sourcing parts is actually becoming easier since Porsche has recently added the 996 to its classic program. But as with all things Porsche, they won't come cheap. There is no such thing as a cheap Porsche. Always buy the absolute best example you can afford. It really is a case of pay me now or pay me later. So which 911 is the best 911? I'm not sure you'll ever have agreement here. Rawness is all the rage today, especially in the automotive enthusiast community like us and amongst collectors. Manual transmission sports and GT cars are now in many cases worth significantly more than their paddle shift and automatic transmission counterparts. Car people have always enjoyed driving. And now, as we are faced with an uncertain future which includes battery electric and hydrogen fuel cell autonomous drones, the allure of an engaging true driver's car is stronger than ever. And that is where the Porsche 996 really shines. The 996 offers enthusiasts the closest link to Porsche's air-cooled past and the simplest, most engaging driving experience short of a track-focused GT3 series. All 911s are incredible sports cars, and an argument could be made for many of them. The 996 generation is unique in that, at its debut, it was the first clean sheet 911 since 1963, and today, the 996 acts as a bridge from the air-cooled 911s of the past to the water-cooled, more luxurious and larger 911s of today and beyond. It offers more of an analog driving experience of the previous 911s than any generation since, and for sure will never be repeated, thanks to numerous governmental and societal changes. This makes the 996 truly a unique and special Porsche 911. With its current market values being well below any other generation, the Type 996.2 Porsche 911 is not only one of the best values in 911, but may in fact be the best non-GT 911 to drive. For everyday driving, it's really hard to beat a 996. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider subscribing and liking below so you won't miss our next episode. Have fun, stay safe, and I'll see you out there.